introduce you to Amir Khusro. Uh, it means it's, it's, it's harder than it seems because I imagine all of you have heard of his name at least that's why you're here. Um, his dates are 1253 to uh, 1254, 1254 to 1325. He spent most of his life in Delhi. He is arguably the most um, well-known cultural figure, not just poet, of um, Islamic India, in a way, there's not been, sort of, there are many, many others, but you know, he's actually the most famous. There are at least three Amir Khosrows, uh, depending on who you're reading, you know, in scholarly discourse, scholarly, uh, in scholarship. There is the Amir Khosrow of art history, right, art historians uh, associate him, uh, specifically his Khamsa, his quintet of five long poems, five masnavis, one of which I'll be talking about today. They associate uh, the Khamsa illustrated in Akbar's court, uh, this painting that you saw in the, the poster, the poster of my talk is actually from Amir, is, is, is from Akbar's court. So if there is Amit Pusro who is of interest to art historians for those illustrations, although he was illustrated widely shortly after he, he died in 1325 already in the, in, in the, in the sort of Turkmen and Timurid empires of eastern Iran. Um, there is also the Amit Pusro of ethnomusicologists. Uh, because of 18th and 19th century, 17th and 18th century legends, uh, largely Sufi, North Indian, Dalga based legends associating Amir Khosro with the origins of Khayal, or Hindustani music, and Qabali. And then there is Amir Khosro of historians and literary scholars uh, who do read Persian, for whom his long poems, 10 long poems, um, are of uh, historical and literary interest. Now these are these three Amir Khosros and you know, when we try and yoke them all together or make generalizations across these three, you end up with, um, as Nuni Sharma, a scholar of Amir put, put it, either these vast, I mean, he ends up looming too large, larger than life, uh, in ways that are not analytically helpful when you read any one of his works, those generalizations won't help you, or he ends up one, you know, kind of monodimensional, just as the inventor of Tavali, right? Um, so that isn't helpful either. So, the trick, I think, to try and you know, in introducing him is to actually begin with very broad strokes which are applicable to everyone in, the, in Delhi's milieu of the 13th and 14th centuries, right, when he lived. Everyone writing in Persian and who had some kind of, and you know, Hindavi or early Hindi Urdu, and who had any kind of truck with the Delhi Sultanate to the courts. I'll begin with broad strokes, um, also sort of, you know, asking why does Persian in India in the first place, I imagine some people must be wondering. <laughs> And uh, then zero in on one poem, one long poem, Alexander and Mira, okay, which was completed in 1302. Okay, so why Persian? How did, why did the Persian language, starting in the, roughly the 900s, come to be cultivated so far outside the borders of what is today Iran, what we associate with Iran today, right? Um, and why did it eventually spread by around the late 1400s to what a certain scholar calls the Balkans to be called? Right, the Balkans being the western extremity, Bengal being the eastern, or even southwestern China being Xinjiang being the western, southwest, the, well, one of the western extremities of Persian, and northern Tamil Nadu being the southernmost extremity, as far as I know, of you know, the regions where Persian is. Why, why, did, why did Persian spread so far outside of Iran? There are no pre Islamic Iranian language, neither Old Western, nor Middle Western, nor Pahlavi spread outside of Iran. You know, although the Achaemenid Empire um, in, in Iran. Um, which ruled from the 6th to 4th centuries BCE, did control a vast region uh, from Egypt to Western India, and yet no Iranian language spread. Right? Largely, the answer lies in two. You don't actually need to look at this in the notes more for myself, but it lies in two phenomena. Um, one was one was the increasing entrance into uh, the ranks of the Abbasid Caliphate in Baghdad of ethnically non-Arab. Iranians, right? uh, who had spoken Persian uh, as a native language and who had, the, had a kind of living memory of an empire, the Sasanian Empire, where uh, Middle Persian was used by the Zoroastrian clergy and the bureaucrat bureaucracy. Um, and uh, when the Abbas Caliphate sort of was, in its, was at its peak of power, you know, um, in the 800s and 900s in Baghdad, its uh, modes of comportment uh, courtly mode of comportment, its conception, very conception of royalty, was fundamentally Zoroastrian Iranian, although it was a caliphate, Muslim caliphate, right? Um, when these ethnic Iranians found themselves increasingly victims of Arab prejudice, because they happened to be ethnically Iranian, um, they reacted by drawing upon the living memories of Zoroastrian rule, 
Um, thus began a sort of culture war, which extended roughly between 900 to around 1250, right? Um, where you had um, ethnic Iranians essentially arguing that, you know, we have these traditions of royalty, whereas you Arabs, but all of this is happening in Arabic, right? Um, whereas you Arabs, for example, your only pre-Islamic heritage is a body of Bedouin poetry, right, which you need to keep intelligible for the sake of uh, the Quran and so forth to make sense of the Quran. Whereas we have this whereas you know, the Arabs would say to the, to the Persians, yes, yes, but you see your kings and your queens were in fact brother and sister and mother and mother and son. So you practiced incest, right? Uh, and then they would say again, but you ate lizards. And all of these sort of, uh, you know, cultural slurs and insults form part of that discourse. Now, what this resulted in was a sort of clearing of space for the earliest language uh, in which you could be literary and Muslim without being Arab, namely Persian. Right? So the making the literalization, the making literary of the earliest language, uh, Muslim language that was not Arabic was Persian. And that became that's you know, it's a kind of a world historical event. Because it means that, you know, centuries later when Bengali, you can be Muslim and Bengali, right? It's really the, the, the kind of the arch model is Persian, right? The earliest language in which you could be Muslim without being Arab Persian, right? That's one um, one major reason. And um, Amit Khosrow, writing at the, at the fag end of that movement, uh, a cultural a cultural war, uh, contributes to it, not just by further literalizing Persian, which was already which was already a literary language by his time, but also extending that model to Hindi, early Hindi Urdu, right, and composing poetry in it. Okay. The other major reason for the spread of Persian, far outside of its uh, home province of south, uh, southwestern Iran, is basically the incursions of, uh, of Turkic nomads right, into the agrarian urban societies of central India and eastern Iran. This happened roughly between the 900s and 1300s. So there were multiple waves of Turkic nomads uh, who made very, very damaging incursions, invasions essentially, uh, into these city societies of agrarian city societies of Eastern Iran and Central Asia. These Turkic groups um, also became Muslim, right? But they lacked any kind of cultural capital. And one of their means, one of the means by which they, in the Lebanon, starting in the around 1080, or I would say 900s, late 900s onwards, uh, 950 onwards, I would say, uh, the, one of the means by which they uh, carved out a courtly identity distinct from that of Abbas and Baghdad was cultivating Persia, right? Um, that's why Firdosi, for example, who completes his Shahnama, the Book of Kings, in what is now in Ghazna, which is what is now Afghanistan, writing for a Ghaznavid um, a Sultan, Mahmud of Ghazni, infamous in India. Um, the reason he would comp he composed this Book of Kings, recalling uh, the, the lore, the royal lore of pre-Islamic Iran, was it was because it was, it was it was a Turkic king trying to sort of uh, raise, you know, his cultural prestige. Uh, by this commission, by the commission of the second point. Um, so what you have, the, the crucial fact to remember about these Turkic kings uh, who extend into Delhi, the earliest Muslim kings of Delhi, in fact the earliest sort of Muslim states or Islamic states in India are in fact Turkic ruled. The interesting or crucial feature about them was, was an asymmetry between political power and cultural prestige. They were politically powerful, but culturally not prestigious. They came from nowhere, they were nobodies. They were pastoralists, right? of remote valleys in Afghanistan. Uh, they made no claims to refinement, learning, scholarship, none of it, right? Uh, so how do you become, the question for these, any of these Turkic kings of India is, how do you rule a vast tract of land uh, and make claims to empire when you uh, can't claim a nobility, right? Because you don't come from noble blood, uh, you don't have any aristocracy. This is, a, this is a medieval state with no aristocracy. So it's very different to medieval Europe, right? Uh, that's why you also can't call it feudal. Um, what do you do? You basically engage in uh, the patronage of what is already high culture, Sanskrit, but also Persian, right? Um, okay, so that's that's the other reason. <clears throat> what this results in is basically uh, the rise of what Richard Eaton has called, this historian has called the Persian cosmopolis. It's a term he invented to complement Sheldon Pollock's idea of the Sanskrit cosmopolis. What are the core features, right? Both the Sanskrit cosmopolis, the idea that you can basically rule a vast tract of land uh, through a canon of texts that are indifferently valued across the tract of land, right? Uh, from Afghanistan to Vietnam, it comes to Sanskrit, and from um, you know Eastern China, sorry, Western China and Bengal to the Balkans in the case of Persian. 
both of these sort of the rise of this the sort of cosmopolitan consciousness uh, more or less coincided. So those of you who know the history of Karnataka would know that the Chalukyas, right, uh, who produced the Manasolas and this great encyclopedia, right, uh, were also of trans, also had trans regional aspirations as emperors and encyclopedism and the elevation of Kannada, right, and, some, and the use of Sanskrit were in fact features of the Chalukya Empire centered in Basavakalyan exactly around the same time as Persian came to be literalized for similar or analogous reasons, okay? Okay. What the core features of the Persian was not less, you know, at least as Polo uh, plays, uh, sorry, as uh, Eton lays them out, uh, was the ideal of the Sultan, right? Rather than the caliph, this is important because in 1258 the Mongols invade and destroy Baghdad. They sack Baghdad. They roll up the caliph, I think, in a carpet and ride horses over him. So uh, anyway, um, which meant that the spiritual, spiritually legitimating center of Sunni rule was gone, right? And Khosrow was born in what 12. Uh, I mean, here he's, he's a young man when that happens, right? And he, the, the long, the event that casts a long shadow across his career and those of and those of you know the careers of Delhi all the Delhi poets and thinkers is this event, which is the annihilation or the extinction of the center of, it's no longer clear what it means to be a Sunni king, right? Because the caliph has been killed, right? Uh, by non-Muslim hordes, right? Um, so, the Sultan was sort of characterized by, he had, he, he bore, it was sort of a pragmatic and the, rather than theologically um, and juridically mandated office, right? It was actually purely juridical. It, it was sort of a juridical title rather than a theological title. <coughs> and he rose above the particularisms of religion. That's broadly the, you know, the, main, the main features of, of a sultanate. Um, it also involved, of course, the valorization of, trans, of a trans-regional prestige language. <coughs> Sanskrit in the case of the Dalgais, but Persian in the case of uh, the Delhi Sultanate, the Hurids, and all of the other sultanates. Competence in which, competence in Persian, depended not on religion, not on birth, but on acculturation, right? On basically learning the comportments, courtly comportments, other, what was happening, right? Uh, and it also depended on masculinity, that's true. So it was sort of a, you know, it was a gender specific ideal of high, high culture. Okay, you all, it also involved an interlinked conception of justice, economy, and politics that did not give a central place to God or religion, right? It was a sort of, um, you know, it was a sort of Sasanian conception, pre Islamic Zoroastrian conception of the state. Uh, which was largely indifferent to the religious identities of uh, the subjects, right? Okay, I mentioned the Mongol Holocaust. Let me say a little bit, little bit more about that. Um, the key event, you know, uh, in relation to this, this Holocaust, you know, is basically these Mongol tribes unified under, you know, uh, a single confederation, brought together into a single confederation by Chinggis Khan, right, in the, you know, in the 1200s, um, who, of course, you know, subdued them to his own control. Genghis Khan, under the leadership of Genghis Khan, they basically, you know, carry out these excursions uh, out of Central Asia, out of what is now Mongolia, into Eastern Iran, Central Asia, and ransack the city sort of societies of that region. Um, they sack entire cities in Transoxiana, Khorasan, Sistan, right? I'll give you a few examples of uh, you know, why this, I'll give you a few some illustrations of why this particular event uh, became a kind of watershed event in Islamic memory, collective memory, right? Um, so you have, for example, the town of Burganj, the Khwarazmian Central Asian Islamic Kingdom of Burganj. Chinggis's sons, Jochi, Chakata, and Bogote, uh, were, were sort of entrusted to the task of reducing Burganj, which was a fortified town. They basically had entire groves of mulberry trees cut down, their trunks soaked in water to harden them and then used over seven months as battering rams. When Burganj family fell, the attackers broke the dams, flooding the city, enslaving its women and children, and deported, as far as one, I mean, one Persian store in Sedar, around 100,000 artisans. Nishapur fell next in April 1221, and you saw on the streets of Nishapur pyramids of skulls, right, of uh, women, men, and children. Right? And of course, the Mongol destruction of Baghdad was, uh, was you know, perhaps the darkest event in uh, the 13th century. World, right? Um, so the significant effect this had for the purposes of my talk, as I said, is, is for partly the genesis of the idea of the Sultan, right? Who was sort of this ambivalent political authority, but not whose theological status was unclear. And um, Khosrow's grandfather and father, who had fled the Mongol invasions into India from Central Asia, were in fact manumitted slaves, freed slaves, um, 
and they inhabited this Mongol dominated or Mongol threatened world where it was no longer clear what it meant to be a Muslim king. Right? This is one of the central features of the game. The other related feature um, is the idea of a slave state. Um, as I said, these were not aristocrats, nor was there any aristocracy or nobility. Um, it was a strange kind of state where, you know, you, as a military commander, you bought slaves, young boys from Central Asia, you know, 10, 7, whatever. And since you bought them, they were valuable for a particular reason. You didn't buy them only from Central Asia, you bought them from West Africa and the Horn of Africa as well. Uh, but these slaves, uh, you know, the idea of military incorporation, or slavery as military incorporation, these slaves were, of course, raised as Muslims, and ra they rose through military ranks to very, very, high, very, very high positions, and eventually broke away into independent kings. So the earliest kingdom of North India, the Gurid Appanage in the 1190s, uh, was in fact a slave state. It was basically an expansion of uh, Muizuddin Guri, Guri's territory in Afghanistan. Right? Um, what that meant is a couple of things. I'm drawing this and drawing largely from Sunil Kumar's work as a wonderful historian of the Delhi Sultanate. These boys would have had a fierce sense of egalitarian solidarity because they were all brought from Central Asia. They had no family, so they were, as the story put it, um, majorly dead. And, uh, how was it? Um, majorly dead and, and socially alienated. They were valuable for that reason because they wouldn't make common cause with anyone. They were fiercely loyal to the man who had bought them, right? Um, but once you, they were deployed to key positions, like the Punjab marches and Bhutan to keep the Mongols out, but once they put roots down, Form local loyalties, they became liabilities. So you tried to buy fresh slaves. Right? Uh, this was the logic. It meant also that um, the very relationship that was constitutive of statehood, military slavery, was fraught with moral ambivalence. Right? Each accession was bloody. Right? Why would your cohort, with whom you were bought from Central Asia, uh, accept your claim for kingship when you had been fiercely in sort of uh, equal, you know, egalitarian uh, until, until that moment? Right? So, no one accession to the throne was ever uncontested. Uh, no one accession was really acceptable from the point of view of the Sharia, right? Uh, these were really secular, in that in a kind of theological sense, theologically indifferent, uh, purely power-based, Turkic states, um, with a bureaucracy that was not rationalized or based on merit, as in the case of the Mughal Empire, but was based purely on uh, personalized, Relations. If the Sultan thought you'd gotten too friendly with the local Rajputs, um, he would bypass you and replace you with a, with, a, with a slave he bought personally from Central Asia. Right? This was a kind of, it, it's sort of a strange kind of state, very different to the Mughal Empire. Okay, so this asymmetry between military power and cultural status was arguably crucial to Khosrow as to others in his video, right? If some of the most beautiful mosques of, of uh, earliest uh, mosques of North India are, very, are sort of architecturally very hybrid heavily dependent on local architecture, for example, the uh, Arhaidin Ka Chopra in Rajasthan, Ajmer, which is very indebted to local Rajasthani temple, temple building traditions, you know, uh, also the emergence or burgeoning of poetry in Hindavi, something other, I mean, arguably the earliest Hindi poem, uh, Chandayan and Mullah Dawood, 1379, not long after Khusro dies, um, you know, is indebted to local upper Gramsha and Jain poetics. All of these sort of were attempts, so many attempts by culturally non-prestigious Turkic individuals with power, right, to build up cultural prestige, okay? Uh, Khosrow was one of them. Okay. All right. Um, this poem uh, I'm going to talk about is the life of Alexander. Uh, Khosrow wrote ten long poems, um, five historical poems. He was unique in the history of uh, the Persian Masnavi. A Masnavi is basically a, a, a narrative poem of an indeterminate length. You can have a Masnavi that's one page long or a thousand pages long. Right? It's all in the same meter and has a rhyme scheme of A, A, B, B, C, C, D, D, and so forth. Right? That's, that's what a Masnavi is. He wrote uh, ten Masnavis, five of them historical, unique in that they were directly about his own, own time. All previous Masnavi writers have sort of set their Masnavis in a mythical past. Right? Uh, he wrote five historical Masnavis of uneven quality, and he wrote five, uh, a set of five Masnavis, a quintet, a khamsa, in response to uh, and an imitation of Nizami of Ganja's famous uh, khamsa. So Nizami lived in, he died in 1209, in what is now Azerbaijan, um, and he wrote a quintet of long romance poems. Khosrow was the first to 
to imitate first in maybe first of maybe around ten individuals um, to imitate uh, imitate imitate with a quintet of their own. Khosro okay. also um, was born into a North India where you had a sort of uh, politically autonomous Sufi culture in the Kasba, in the small towns of North India, a uh, uh, culture of scholarship. You probably had two sources of sovereignty, legitimate, legitimate authority in North, in Muslim North India of the time. You had the Sufi Sheikh and you had the Sultan. These were largely independent of each other, moved in separate circles. Indeed, Persian literature itself has historically been produced in two sites, right? At least from the 900s to around the 1500s. You have the court and you have the Dargah, Sufi Dargah, right? Uh, for the 1500s onwards, we get to have kind of mercantilism, which was used in Persian poetry, also in coffee houses and so forth. Okay. Um, theologically, uh, this is important, especially in the wake of the destruction of the Abbasid Caliphate. Theologically, being a Sunni Muslim in North India, he would have had available to him a prominent, you know, on this prominent question of free will versus fatality, versus, versus fatalism. That a key theological question, he would have had, to him, had available to him on the middle position that had already been worked out by the 900s, which was that you actually don't have free will, you, do only, you only do God's bidding, but you must act as though you do, right? You must act as though you do and take responsibility for your actions. It was a kind of theological <coughs> middle position for uh, Hanafi Muslims of North India, of which was wrong. Okay. Um, in terms of further literary context, the other important thing I just mentioned is Sufism, one of the key features was allegory, right? Uh, Sufism cultivated allegory like no other literary culture in the world, I would say, right? It's one of the greatest allegorical traditions of world literature. Um, already in the early numbers, we begin to have Persian allegorical interpretations of the Quran, right? Uh, this is important because Khosro exploits that uh, for a variety of purposes, and it would have raised above all to prestige, to have very prestigious status, a particular figure of speech which Khosro loves, called Iham which literally in Arabic means casting, making ambiguous, but has a kind of technical meaning where you use a word or a phrase, or sometimes one can even argue an entire poem, with two meanings, right? One salient, or mani and nazdik as they say, sort of proximate meaning, and one distant, or non-salient, remote meaning, and it's the remote meaning that's intended, right? So it's somewhat different to the shlesha, uh, to the Sanskrit shlesha, right? Okay. Um, these are the, this is so much by way of context. Um, any reader familiar with Khusro, with, with the Persian Khusro, would know that he has this sort of his Persian works, which are by the way the only works by him that can that we can confidently say are by him. None of the Hindavi works uh, are of philologically stable attribution. We don't know they've actually composed by him. Right? He says he composed Hindavi, but he barely records any. He records a few poems. We don't know that he composed uh, any of the works on music that are attributed to him. The only works we can confidently say Abai and Khosrow is his Persian corpus. That's it, right? And this is an introduction to his Persian corpus, specifically through this one poem. Uh, the fifth in the Quintet of Masnavis, which is the life of Alexander, or the Alexander and Mirror, the life of Alexander. Okay. So, one of the interesting things about his Persian works is he gives you a sense every now and then that there are these uh, subterranean relations with Indian languages, literatures, right? So, for example, um, you know, his. Uh, one of his Remarkable Masnavis, uh, it's called Nine Skies, composed in 1318, and it's it's unique in that each each of the nine chapters corresponding to the skies is in a different meter. That had been normal in Sanskrit Kavya, at least since Raghuvamsha, Kalidasa. It had not been normal in Persian at all, right? It's suggested, is he getting it from Sanskrit Kavya? He didn't know Sanskrit, but he was very interested in it. He was surrounded by uh, Sanskrit intellectuals, especially Jains, who were uh, arguably more open about their knowledge than Brahmins. Um, he used, for example, a particular kind of, he was very proud of having invented a particular kind of punning verse whose lexemes, whose words, you know, can be vocalized as Hindi or Hindavi and as Persian at the same time. Depends on where you pass them, right? This we know is common in Sanskrit, you have Sanskrit, Kannada, Prakrit, Sanskrit, kind of, but you don't have that uh, in Persian, right? In Persian you have a couplet, one line of which is in Persian, the other is in Arabic or Turkish. But imagine a single line of poetry which you can pass as two languages. Right. That's then it's normal in Sanskrit, Khosro does it in Persian. It's suggestive, is he getting it from Sanskrit? Right? So this is one of the relations where this is a, one of the features of his Persian works. He has these sort of suggestive gestures towards the vernacular and vernacular mediated Sanskrit, right? which subtly deforms the poetics of his Persian works. Um, <clears throat> okay, how are we to read these deformations? What do they really mean? Um, he, you know, it, it's not clear that they are 
expressions of what a certain literary theorist may be spread would have called a contact zone. She described contact zones as a quarter, social spaces where cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in context of highly asymmetrical relations of power. Now, it doesn't appear to be the entire cultures met here. What you have, rather, is highly asymmetrical. What you have, rather, he was part, Khosrow was part of what Sunil Kumar describes as the general militarization of medieval society in North India, right? And, the, and he was also sort of, he sang the praises of, he was a chorister for the winning side in the Sultanate's victories over Rajput Chittor, Yadava Devagiri, and Kakatiya Varangal. But he also seems to have, at the same time, regarded India's Brahmins as superior to Aristotle in their philosophical accomplishment. He regarded, he says this in a, in a kind of a non-allegorical, very clear way in his nine skies. Sanskrit is linguistically superior to Persian, and Hindustan's climate as superior to that of Khurasan and other world regions, right? So it's not clear that an asymmetry of military power aligned with an asymmetry of cultural power. Indeed, to me, the most persuasive explanation seems to lie in this very disjuncture, as I said a moment ago, this disjuncture between Islamic military triumphalism or the Turkic military triumphalism of his Congress of Hindustan and the prestige of its native cultural and scholarly life. Right? That's the asymmetry that really allows Osho to do these remarkable things. He also knows he's a frontier poet. He, uh, and he, he stands at you know, the edge of many things. He's, he knows he's the earliest major poet of South Asia, uh, Persian poet of South Asia. He knows that he's at the eastern edge of the Islamic world. Um, he knows that um, he can sort of, because of you know the culturally unaccomplished masters he serves, he can get away with a lot poetically in terms of stylistic innovation. They wouldn't know any better, right? Arguably, right? Um, so what I'm going to give you briefly, with what follows in about for about half an hour, is a reading and interpretation of how this disjuncture between Islamic military power and Indian cultural called scholarly prestige led to Khosrow's rewriting in his Aina Iskandari, in his Alexander Rira, of a tale that, as far as I know, appears first in the Yoga right? which, is, which was a key Advaitic text in his middle. So, in around 1302, he completed this poem in response to uh, Nizami Ganjali's Alexander book, Iskandar Nama, which, which Nizami completed in 1202, 100 years ago, uh, previously in what is now Azerbaijan. Khosrow rewrote the book in a certain sense. Broadly, Nizami, what Nizami did, was uh, he composed the life of Alexander in two volumes, in two books, in which he traced the first of which was about Alexander as an imperial adventurer and conqueror, the world conqueror, and the second of which was about Alexander's humbling from an, from an imperial adventurer into a prophet. Right? Um, Husserl's retelling doesn't present Alexander as a prophet. Um, he presents him as, as a divinely inspired Sufi king. Right? And this freed Khosrow to turn Alexander into a philosopher, saint, king, engineer, I'll talk about why engineer, and a patron of engineers or artisans. Uh, and this really became, uh, you know, the predominant model of Muslim kingship after Khosrow. Okay. As to why, uh, someone was asking me, Lakshmi was asking me, uh, why would the life of Alexander become, why would, you know, why would Alexander, uh, was it someone else? Was it you? Was it you? Yes. Why would the life of Alexander be, you know, the supreme fiction of, uh, the ancient and early medieval world across, you know, from, from uh, Europe, Western Europe, all the way to China. Um, I'll just say, make a few broad remarks. I don't have time to explore that today, but I'll content myself with observing that the most persuasive explanation I have come across yet in scholarship is by this scholar, David Selden, who says basically that just as uh, Aristotle's metaphysics, Aristotle was Alexander's teacher, as you know, was the philosophical expression of a certain state system. The life of Alexander was the literary expression of the same state system. What was that state system? It was what he calls the Levantine Mediterranean tributary state. So you have, you know, Alexander yoking together different regions under his nominal command while letting each region remain culturally independent, right? And the kind of philosophy that kind of vast state structure produced was um, a metaphysics that explained the world, the world's multiplicity, as the many descending from the one. That's Plotinus, right? Um, that's also, in a way, uh, the monism, it's also, you know, Advaita monism, right? Which is one of the reasons why Advaita was so, it, it, it appeals so much to almost every uh, Persian-speaking, Persian-using uh, dynasty of North India and Central India, right? Um, so, <coughs> the, the romance of Alexander was the way in which the meaning of the state system, right, this tributary system was expressed. Just as Aristotle's philosophy and many of its variations, 
was the philosophical expression of that same state system. That's broadly why, from around 1330 BCE, when Alexander dies, to 1450 CE, um, the life of Alexander remained the old fiction of uh, tran any trans-regional um, any transition empire that retained hetero uh, cultural, het cultural um, het heterogeneity within itself. Okay. I'm going to show you a few images just from. Yeah. Well, this is like. Uh, this is um, you know, this is from what is now Uzbekistan. This is like this is an image of Alexander from Sasanian pre-Islamic from around one, first century AD to three hundred AD. This is Alexander with ram's horns, you can see. It's a fresco from Fayyaz Tepe in Uzbekistan. Um, the Quran calls him two-horned, right? Uh, it was already, the Quran was already, chapter 18 of the Quran, already uh, in that this particular pre-Islamic image of Alexander as bearing ram's horns, and the bearing of the helmet with ram's horns. Um, this is uh, Alexandre de Bernay. This is basically, a, I think, as, I, as far as I recall, a 14th century French version of the life of Alexander. Alexander's been lowered in a diving bell into the depths of the ocean so he can explore the depths of the ocean. Alexander is the arch boundary crosser of the ancient world. Right? He, he crosses every boundary, every kind of, not just geographical, up, down, north, east, southwest, uh, gender, um, you know, every kind of boundary crosser. Okay? Um, this is, yeah, this is the, again, Alexander the Diving Bell, uh, 1444, England, England and France. Okay. This is the Russian, uh, Russian image of Alexander being lowered in the Diving Bell, I think 17th century Russia. And this is my favorite. This is by Mukunda, 1597, Upper Scott. Uh, we, have, we see Alexander being lowered in a diving bell into the ocean, depths of the ocean, right? Um, okay, just a few images. So to return to what I was saying, presenting Alexander as a divinely inspired Sufi engineer or patron of artisans, or machine makers, rather than a philosopher, also allowed Khosrow in his own video to turn Alexander into a, a model, an exemplar for Sultan Alauddin Khilji, who had one whose one of whose titles was uh, Sikandar Sani, Alexander II. Um, a few images from, architectural images from Khosrow's life. Um, this is the Alayda Raza, built by Radim Khilji, so towards the beginning of his career. <laughs> and this is from, towards the end of his career, is Gyasuddin Tughlaq's tomb, right? Uh, just two different, sort of, you know, uh, sorry. Uh, I'll come to this image in a bit. <laughs> so, Ziauddin Baruni, uh, who's his younger contemporary and his friend at the Aladdin Khilji's court, his historian, he complained that Aladdin Khilji failed to adequately patronize the thousands, or literally thousands, of artisans and engineers who had flooded to Delhi as refugees from the Mongols. Right? And, and um, much of the cultural renaissance that Delhi saw under Aladdin Khilji, especially architectural, was thanks to these artisans, architects, you know, calligraphers, engine bookmakers, binders, and so forth. Uh, and he complained that you know, he adequately failed to patronize them. It's possible that Amir Khosrow wrote this poem at least partly to criticize the Sultan and furnish him with a positive example by holding up Alexander as a, as a, as a model. Right? <coughs> okay, uh, this particular Masnavi, um, it's about three, in the printed, printed edition, it's about you know, 350 pages long. And um, towards the beginning, uh, you, you know, after praising God, the Prophet, Sultan al Adin Khalji, Nizamuddin Aliyah, he uh, then includes, strangely, a little tale, just a page long, from the Yogavashishta. It doesn't tell you where it's from. In fact, he sets the tale in this place called Guta in Damascus. And the tale goes as following. There's a man in Guta who suspects that the Prophet's mad journey, the Prophet, as you know, is supposed to you know, descended up from Jerusalem into, up to God's throne and back into his bed, I presume, right, in the flash of a second, right? Or, you know, sort of, you know, in a kind of, uh, I mean, in time that you can't measure with any normal, any, any normal yardstick. That's the kind of measure that the <coughs> This is one of the most famous sort of, you know, uh, scenes from Islamic iconography, painting, and so forth. This is, in fact, uh, an image of the Prophet's night journey from the 1330s, painted for the Mongols, which is recently converted to Islam in Iran, northern Iran. Okay, um, it's, it's, 
Okay, so this man suspects that uh, the profit can't possibly have actually gone up in a flash to go through and come back. You know, it must have been just his imagination. Okay, so he on grounds of rational probability, he says it comes up happening to himself, he says. And then he goes to bathe by the river. He goes to, goes to the river to bathe, leaves his clothes by the river. And as soon as he dips his head and dips himself into the water, he finds himself, he sees himself transformed in another land into a woman. Where he spends seven years, gets married, and bears 17 children, right? To the man he gets married to. And that woman he's turned into goes back to the river to bathe. And as soon as she dips herself in the river, she sees herself transformed into the man she had been, back into the man she had been. And the clothes she'd taken off are still there, and no time has passed at all. Right? And then she realized, he, she, she, well, the gender, you know, Kukusro loves blurring binaries, gender binaries included. So does he, she, hope this, this man, okay, this Brahmin, and, and in fact, the tales from Yogabasha shows us, let's say the Syrian Brahmin, as I like to call him. The Syrian Brahmin basically realizes, or is humbled, uh, or ashamed, he was ashamed at having suspected, at having sort of had the temerity to exercise his reason alone in judging God's miracles, and he realizes that in fact God can suspend the laws of time and space uh, to humble you. Okay? Why would you not? Why would he say? There's so many questions. Why would you take this tale in Indic tale? Right? He could have. He could have done this. Any other tale, he would simply have said it. Right? And he does say, why choose an Indic tale, Sanskritic tale? Why set it in Syria? Right? So many questions. Um, so in a way, my my the rest of my. And in 20 minutes or so, it's an attempt to answer this question. Why did Khosro draw on this? Uh, at the end of this tale, uh, there's a line where this man feels, sitting around and feels ashamed, he says, Khosro says, or of him, he says, he clung to the Sharia as he thus lost his footing. He expelled all melancholy from his mind. And the word for melancholy is a Greek word in Persian too, machulia, right? Now, melancholy in the Galenic, Arabo Galenic psychology or medical system that Husserl's poems assumes was thought to arise from overheated black bile. And among its symptoms was a great deal of deliberating and delusions. Okay? So I'm just going to show you one image from the films. Um, okay. Sorry, I thought I had it. One second. Mansur's Anatomy. This is, one of, this is a 14th century anatomy um, from 1384, shortly after Husserl, early, you know, say, let's say, younger contemporary of Husserl in Iran. And uh, it's just, to, just to give you, a, I mean, give you a diagram of how the nervous system looked to a medieval Muslim anatomist and surgeon. Okay. Um, Khosrow's mention of medical in the poem seems ambivalent, right? Because on the one hand, it suggests that this man's vision of his other life was delusional, right? But on the other hand, he affirms the reality, the literal physical reality of the Prophet's night journey through Hindu metempsychosis. In other words, through the idea of the transmigration of the soul, which is unacceptable doctrinally to any Sunni Muslim. Right? It's acceptable only to a certain particular theologically marginal sects of Shia Muslims, right? The idea that your soul is rebirth, rebirth. And yet it's through a tale of rebirth that he affirms the reality of the Prophet's night journey. Or, or rather God's suspension of the laws of physics, you know, you know for, for the journey. It's ambivalent. It's ambivalent that you can't really settle on any one interpretation. It's irreducibly ambivalent, right? Um, we know that, uh, you know, from his Nine Skies that he composed in 1318, he took a particular attitude towards Brahmin learning. Uh, he spent the first two chapters, the first two skies of Nine Skies, describing Mubarak Shah Khaljis, or rather his Malik Kafur's invasions of the other and uh, Karati of Arangal. And it's, those chapters are filled with Islam, of the sort of Islamic triumphalism over the infidel, over the Hindu, that you would see in history, in royal histories. But then the third sky, which is the most famous of those Nine Skies, he overturns those uh, Hindu Muslim binaries, Hindu Muslim, uh, you know, figures in a of ways. In the first two the skies, you see the Hindu, or the, you know, the sort of indeterminate Hindu, uh, presented as inchoate, mud-like, black, dark, and the Turkic Muslim as light-skinned, ray-like in his focus, um, rational, and so forth. And then in the third sky, he overturns them all by praising, overturns these binaries by praising um, the Brahmins of India, their philosophical accomplishment, and you know their scholarship, Sanskrit itself, and eventually ends that sky with a ghazal, remarkable ghazal, uh, where he becomes the Brahmin. He becomes a Turkic Brahmin or a Brahmin Turk, right? So these, you know, so many of Khosrow's romances or long poems are in dialogue with royal histories. What they do, much of part of their rhetorical and intellectual labor, is to dig up the binaries that frame uh, Islamic political imagination and overturn them or blur them. 
right? That's something he does. Man or woman, Hindu, Muslim, um, you know, a variety of animals. I mean, uh, what are the others? Human, animal, a variety of animals. Okay? I, can go, I can go into that if you want. So, um, in this particular poem, Alexander Mira, this, you know, what happens to the Syrian Brahmin seems to be a submission to Islam, because he goes on to the Sharia, gives up melancholy, and the line, you know, the, the chapter ends, the short chapter ends by saying, uh, Husro says he prefers the intoxication of wine to a world of intellection, and he warns against the artifices uh, of the inauspicious intellect that for hell's sake fashions a wax date palm for you. It's a curious image, a date palm made of wax. And he says, that's what the intellect does when you give it too much credence, right? Now this image of wax date palm is not original to Husro, we see it in earlier poets, but he makes original use of it. For him, throughout these 300 pages, the wax date, date palm reappears at key moments as a metaphor for, um, you know, uh, socially useful inventions that are ultimately fruitless because wax date palms can't be fruit, right? Uh, they use this because they don't give you immortality. So the core message with regard to of course, sort of flat yeah, message, if you like, if you want to put it that way, uh, with regard to um, the variety of inventions that Alexander patronizes in the poem, is that no matter how much you master the world with machines, um, you must uh, come to terms with your own mortality because you will die. No machine can save you from death. Right? That's the core message, and that's an old message. It's not you know, original to him, but the way he conveys it is quite quite remarkable. Um, what does he do? Well, what are the central invention, uh, or the central machine, if you like, you know, uh, at the heart of this poem, is the mirror itself. There are these merchants who come and complain to Alexander that, you know, our ships are constantly waylaid in the Mediterranean by pirates, could you do something? And Alexander essentially uh, produces a bricolage device. He combines Jamshid, the Emperor Jamshid's goblet. Now, this was basically a world-revealing goblet, which you could see in the mysteries of the world, you know, in its polished sides. He, and then Aristotle's astrolabe, which was sort of the computer of the Islamic Middle Ages, right? Uh, you could measure the, you know, your, uh, your location in the night sky. And, um, and of course, the mirror, the Chinese mirror, right? To build this mirror that he mounts on top of a, of a tower. This. Um, these are the, this, is from, this is by Mukunda again, the 1590s, 1595, 96. Um, Mughal court. So, okay. what does he do with this, you know, um, essentially you have, I'm trying to cut ahead in the interest of time so we can have Q&A, because I want to talk about time. Um, yeah. Husserl's uh, position on on um, on these machines was essentially, or devices, was um, rather was quite distinct to that of two other major writers who imagined the place of technology and scale of technology in his milieu. Saadi's Gulistan. The Rose Garden, completed in 1258 in, uh, in Shiraz, uh, so within his lifetime. Uh, perhaps the most famous prosimetric work of the medieval Persian. We have many Iranians who recite passages of it by heart today. Now, that particular work, it's made up of you know, anecdotes uh, in sweet chapters, thematically organized chapters. It's central, you know, it's, it's a text of akhlaq. Now, the akhlaq is basically the genre of Arab or Persian, but mainly Persian ethics. Ethics, but specifically the Aristotelian tradition. The Gomakian ethics was basically rendered into Arabic and then was sort of much elaborated in Persian. The central idea there was you should prepare yourself for a rainy day by stocking up skills. What was what are skills? Skills are basically abilities by which you manipulate the object world around you for human ends. Right. Um, so the akhlaqi conception of human sociality, of human, human world, was one in which was one that was made up of cautious exchanges of good, three kinds of maybe four kinds of objects, words, <coughs> gifts, and goods. Three kinds of objects, shall we say, right? Uh, the cautious circulation of three kinds of goods, overseen by God. The Akhlaqi God was not the God of the Quran. He was basically 
a sort of just overseer, right? Almost a kind of uh, someone who oversaw um, equitable exchange, right? Um, that particular text conceived of skill precisely as the manipulation of machines for human and civic purposes. The other major discourse on technology or engineering was Nasiruddin Tusi, the great, great astronomer, mathematician, and uh, you know, uh, uh, astronomer, but also a uh, literary theorist and political theorist in northern Iran, who composed, uh, among his many works, a text called Akhlaq in Nasri, the Nasirian Ethics, in around 1235. And for him, um, the inventor was, was always superior to the executor. The inventor was someone like Alexander, who came up with these blueprints, these designs, and um, who came up with these machines or commanded the making of these machines that would be put in the service of civic benefit so that everyone in the virtuous city could imitate God, or rather could imitate the philosopher king, right? Who imitated God? And there was a general sense of death, you know, a sense of godliness and beatitude, right? This is basically, if you read Plato's Republic, I mean, Nastusi's Akhlaq and Nasri is really a vision, a Platonic vision of the virtuous city. Husserl is distinct in that he's not interested in uh, Neoplatonic or these Platonic, uh, you know, collective exercises and perfection and virtue. He's interested merely in prescribing the right attitude towards technology, which is one of humility, um, a kind of humble contentment with the kind of civic virtue machine making, engineering can bring, and that's all. Right? In that sense, he's closer to Sadi, to the Buddhist than he is to Akhlaq and Asri. Right? This is how he relates to the major discourses of technology in his milieu. Um, okay. But precisely, precisely this reason, he this laid open Husserl's vision of technology to the risk of implying the sufficiency of the internet. Here's why I circle back to why he would use this Yoga Vashishta tale at all. Um, if you if you if you you know if you sort of write a long poem, it seems to be valorizing or celebrating Alexander's um, mastery of machines. You would seem to actually be valorizing the intellect, right? Um, and this is where he invoked a character well known already long before his time, uh, already by the 900s in Arabic and you know, Syria and Palestine, a figure known in Islamic heresiography for asserting the sufficiency of intellect, the Brahman, right? Uh, through obscure roots, the figure of the Brahman already entered. The theology produced by Jews and Arabs writing in um, Jews, <laughs> Jews and Muslims, so Jews and Muslims writing in Arabic, in, as early as the 900s uh, and continuously into the 1300s, you see the figure of the Brahmin arising as far west as Syria, Palestine, Iraq, right? And these are theological texts. Now, this Brahmin is basically a proof of action. It's just a kind of he's a straw man, right? He's a straw man invoked for one reason alone. He asserts that the intellect is sufficient. You don't need prophecy. Right? He renders the succession of prophets after Adam redundant or nonsensical. He basically says that if God is perfect, as you, as, you, as, you, as you assume, then why would he not have taught his laws sufficiently and therefore perfectly, and here I'm drawing on Sarah's from Sarah's scholarship, to the first prophet named Adam. Right? Why have no prophets after Adam? So why have prophecy at all? Right? Uh, the intellect is, is enough. And this is what this, stick, this straw man figure of the Brahmin basically, uh, you know, that, that's what they, these Jewish and Muslim theologians put in the mouth of this Roman Brahmin, and they always defeat him to, you know, essentially make arguments for the necessity of prophecy. Okay, this is arguably why Husserl is invoking, or why he uses this Yoga Vashish right? This is why this Brahmin becomes useful. He's invoking this old theological figure of the Brahmin uh, to what to do what would seem to be a humbling of him, to kind of perform a humbling of the Brahmin, right? Because the Brahmin basically loses his footing, holds on to the Sharia, and gives up melancholy and it would seem that he sort of submitted to Islam. In the sense, what this specifically means is, he realizes the vanity of an overinvestment in the intellect, in reason, right? And yet, as I said, it's still ambiguous, because he, uh, Khosro seems to do this, seems to humble the Brahmin, the Syrian Brahmin, to, you know, a Sufi intuition and faith rather than an overexercise of the intellect, by validating rebirth which, as I said, is unacceptable doctrinally to any mainstream uh, Muslim theology, right? So it's, a, what's Khosrow really doing? Right? I mean, is he actually merely humbling, invoking a Brahmin to humble him, the kind of, you know, the straw man Hindu, or is he actually, uh, you know, tacitly, in fact, valorizing, um, you know, a doctrine that's unacceptable, right? Uh, 
Um, this is partly what I meant when he said, when I said earlier that Khusru, one of Khusru's burdens is to take up these binaries and invert them, right, or blur them. <coughs> okay, uh, let's see. Let me show you a few more images and I'll, I'll conclude and I'll take any questions you might have. Okay, so this is from um, the 14, 1590s. It's from, it's by Mukunda from Upper Court. I can. No one miniature ever only illustrates the text. You know, it visually exceeds what it's supposed to illustrate. I don't have time to talk about how it you know, spills over, but I'm happy to do so if you have questions. You know, there are all these European motifs, you know, from the Northern European Renaissance here. You have, uh, yeah, I can talk about that more if you want, okay? Um, this is Alexander meeting the Brahmins from 1719, North India, okay? This style is also, you know, rather distinct to that of the central Mughal court. It's much closer to the party miniatures, you know, made by Nancy and so forth. Uh, I don't know where, where it gets from. Okay. Uh, this is from the 1330s, Tabriz, northern Iran. These are the Brahmins. They look, you know, they're, they're white, bearded, uh, bareheaded, naked presumably, uh, behind rocks. They're pre civilizational Right? They basically stand for this, you know, there is a, there's another boundary many of these paintings invoke, which is basically the Brahmin, and the, the Brahmin or the sage, or Plato in a cave. Uh, the cave stands, both in Mughal painting, as well as a lot of literature, such as Khusro and Nizami and so forth, mm -hmm. for uh, this kind of archetypal image of a womb-like space into which you withdraw um, and return with wisdom, right? Uh, so you have the Brahmins here, okay, which is stylus, Chinese, if anything, because these are Mongols mediating Chinese painting to northern Iran. Um, this is from the 1570s, Iran. Uh, this is Alexander. Um, well, sort of banqueting with uh, and being entertained by Kani Fu, who is a Chinese slave, who figures in Khosrow's poems. This is an illustration of the Zami is Alexander, but not from Khosrow. Uh, the style again is very different. Uh, Kanifu is a Chinese slave woman who dresses as a man and has the skills of a male warrior, but is defeated by Alexander, and when he discovers that in fact this is a woman, he uh, courts her, right? And brings her back to uh, presumably Greece, I'm not sure where. Anyway, so I want to show you, since I've said to you, I, this is the translation I made, maybe I'll end with this and maybe one does This is Alexander's last will and testament. In my translation. I don't know if you want to hear the poetry. If you do, I can be done. Yes, yes, yes. 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 I'll read out the Persian. I'll read out the Persian and then I will read out the English. He has, uh, after his underwater journey in the sea, after he's lowered into the sea and in the company of an angel who guides him through these wonders, underwater wonders, he then emerges and after the angel tells him he's going to die, he doesn't have much longer left. He is returned to shore by the angel and then he lays out these commands for his, you know, his men. And there are essentially three of them. Read out, this is the, okay, um, I'm just going to read out only the portion of the Persian that I translated. Okay. So the, the meter is the same as the Shahnameh, the Book of Kings. Okay, it's a short, long, long, short, long, long, short, long, long, short, long. Okay, and it's a meter associated with epics, with battle narration, with uh, feasting and fighting, very public themes. Nachostin vasiat darin daavari, be farzan de khud ba yadam yaavari, be dar asra man kust rakhshan leba, ham az gohare man furuzat chura. Dovon an ke bar az me sahra ye raz, chu dar mahd ismat konan ba daraz, dar an dam te galtan be sandu to past, ze sandu biru koni dam do dast. Ke ta chun ze khamane giraniyam be rakh, konat har ke dinad ibrat nigah. که چون من برایت سکانی شرف ز نقع زمین تا به دریای جرف به فیروزی از چرق فیروز فام به زبط خداورد آدم تمام جهان داده از زور بازوی من همه نقد خود در ترازوی من ز چندان زر و گوهره بی شمار توی دست رفتم سرن جام کار بگویم تو خلق نبد بگویم تو خلق نبد زارگی ببینم این روز بی این روز بی چارگی تمنای هستی از دل کم کنند نبر من که بر خیش ما تم کنند کسی کو مرا بیرد ارکس بود نمودار من پند او بس بود 
سوم آن که چون نوبت نوبت آن شود که تنبر دل خاک نه آن شود در اسکندریه که جای من است بنا کرده رسم و رای من است گراییدم از تخت زر در مراق ولیت سپارید خاکی به خاک My first testament as to I'm trying to evade the meter. My first testament as to what must be done is aid and assistance to my dearest son, for he is my castle's most radiant garden. Lit from my essence is a shining lantern. Second, as I depart into mystery and set foot in the cradle of piety, no sooner than into my coffin I roll, with both hands lift me from my coffin hole. So that when from my home I wend my way, each person who gazes will take heed and say. How a kingdom Caesar so wondrous as me, from earth's, earth's motley face unto the depths of the sea, by victory bestowed by the sky's turquoise bowl, I subdued the world wholly to my control. By force of my arms did the world come to pour into my wing scales all its wealth and splendor. For all that gold and glitter, I went my way, just empty-handed at the end of the day. Let them urge upon all who, all who stand and who stare that they look upon this day of despair, and from craving for life they set their hearts free, and mourn for themselves rather than for me. If he who sees me should be worthy enough, my example to him is, is advice enough. Third, when it finally thus comes to pass, that my body is earth's guest deep under the grass, in Alexandria that's my own most place, erected by my will and wisdom and grace, let me tumble from gilded throne to a pit, and trust into dust, dust that belongs to it. Should I draw out my jugular? 
Why should I go into trouble for your love? For you're, not, you're no less than love of so not. Darik nis ke suzan him doan khodra. The dustis ke chun so not mohtarami. It's no grieving matter that Hindus should burn themselves as on the pile, funeral pile. It's for love for your revered like so not. Namunde mi sharat afar ta safa ye khanat ta abgine ye Hindi nei ke jame jami. The universe appears in your body's translucence. You're an Indian crystal, not Jamshid's world-revealing goblet. Siyah tahti ye Hindu gubat safid rukham, to as siyah ye Hind ze safidi rakami. My white face is the black slate of the Hindu. On India's blackness, also it's a pun, not a good or, or on India's indistinction, or of India's ink, you are a cipher of whiteness. Chigash khusro e jadu zabu me ramze ye to, bekhaab bastanash afsun Hindu chedami. Since Khusro the Conjurer has enthralled to your glancing eyes, what are Indian incantations to keep him from sleep? Okay, now this poem, you see the number of things he's doing with, with, with this idea of collapsing binaries. Okay, this is the, the, the binary, the operative binary here is the, is the Turk and the Brahman, the Turk and the Hindu. But you also have something else. He, when he says Persian Brahman, Brahman Ajami, Ajam is one of the oldest identity labels in Islamic history. It, in its earliest, Usages by Arabs refer to Persian barbarians, people who garbled Arabic when they spoke it because they were not native speakers. It had a pejorative connotation. Its earliest usages in the seventh, in the seventh century. But very swiftly, it shed those pejorative connotations to refer to Persia in general, whose borders even included India in a way. I mean, people who spoke Persian, not Persia per se. Um, so his beloved here, the beloved of the Mashuk, the Mahbub of this Ghazal, is in fact a kind of Persian Brahmin, or you know, some kind of pagan, you know, you have at least two or three identity oppositions being collapsed. You have the Persian and the Brahmin, you have the barbarian, you know, uh, beloved, you have the Hindu and the Turk, uh, idolater, <coughs> but also also the Brahmin is written by him. The Brahmin is a product of Khusro's writing because he says, as every province of your face rebellious, except now in Persian poetry, uh, Prepubescent boys at the edge of puberty, you know, when they have their stubble about to sprout, are objects of great, great desire. The, the beloved in the Persian Urdu Ghazal, as you know, is, uh, is male. It's a kind of homoerotic genre. He plays on that convention to, sh to sort of suggest that uh, the region of your territory, or also the blackness of your cheek down, but also the writing of your story. Sabat <laughs> khutte means story or affair, khutte means region. Right? Sabat means both region but also ink. Right, he's punning at multiple levels. Um, is written and slender. Everything is rebellious except the writing of, of this Brahmin, who is in fact, because of calligraphy, is slender. Right? Uh, he's a product of Khosrow's, he's, 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 he's a brainchild of Khosrow's, literally. Um, he plays with the idea of the Indian peacock. One of the reasons for India's greatness in his geographical imagination is that it has the peacock. Right? Um, he also analogizes him to this Brahmin beloved to, to Lat, who is one of the goddesses of uh, pagan Mecca. You know, one of the gods, one of the idols, goddess idols who Muhammad removed from Mecca, from Kaaba. From Ka he says this is the Lat of Somnath, right? Um, and of course, he invokes this old idea, which his friend in the same court as he also invokes, that the reason Hindus burn themselves is because India's land of love. Uh, it's a fanciful kind of explanation. Um, he compares him to a classic object in uh, the Persian epic, Jamshi's World Revealing Goblin. He says, you're not that, you're an Indian crystal. He's very keen on, in a way, inserting India's virtues into a kind of a lyric and geographical imagination um, to essentially argue that India was as distinctive, or in fact more distinctive and more virtuous than any other place in Islamic geography. And he does that through these collapsing of binaries. Okay? Uh, yeah, I'll stop there. I'll stop there, and if you're interested in that long pun, I can share it with you. <laughs> Any questions? Any questions uh, about anything? Go ahead, my question might sound a little naive because 
I'm not familiar with this wonderful world of poetry of Amir Kushru, but all I'm familiar with is the love of Amir Kushru and uh, Nizamuddin. And the poetry that ensued from their love, or even the time when, when uh, 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 Nizamuddin uh, passed away, and Amir Kushru was born from Bengal and he died, you know, just pining at his tomb. So I've come across only that kind of love poetry. So this for me was a complete revelation. And as I mentioned to you, this Alexander being such a strong figure for this Sufi, I, I don't know whether you would call Kushru a Sufi, because he had so much of Brahmanism and Hinduism and theology from all over. Would you call him a Sufi? He was very much a Sufi. And uh, one of the reasons there's no contradiction between this invocation, these invocations of big and beloved, in this case of Brahman, uh, and being a Sufi is because of one of the first points I made, which is one of the key features of Sufi hermeneutics, Sufi interpretative practices, was the Iham. The idea that a text or any sign, even the world as a sign, as a cipher, had two meanings, at least two. Right? One was the proximate, immediate meaning for people who uh, attended to outward appearances. But the other was the remote meaning, which was the true meaning, which was the authentic meaning, right? which was the, let's say, divinely intended or any other, or even poetically intended meaning. This particular feature is something that he prized, he prided himself on. He says in his autobiographical preface in uh, Composer on 1298, he says that, you know, other poets have invented Ihams with just two or three meanings. I have invented an Iham with seven meanings in three languages, right? Arabic, Persian, and Hindi. And my Ihams work in across, you can read one of my couplets, he actually gives you an example, you can, you can, read his, you can vocalize his couplet um, in three languages. So that's a Sufi feature. Uh, now, so when he says, when he speaks of Brahman, whatever, you know, he's in a longer tradition of invoking pagan beloveds, Turkic pagan, non Muslim, Turkic pagan beloveds, whoever. These are all very pious Muslims. It's not like, you know, they're having affairs with Brahmins. So that's not what's happening. This is a convention, uh, but it is socially effective in, a, in ways other than actual love affairs. It, it, the way it's effective is it allows for uh, a kind of yeah, basically, Sufi and courtly interest in Sanskrit and Sanskritic textual traditions, which are read as much of the way the Darashko will read them. As you've seen, the Darashko commissions his famous, trans his famous Persian translations of the Upanishads. He translates or has them translated as commentaries on the Quran. Right? The Upanishads basically anticipate a truth already enunciated in the Quran. Right? Now, that's much, uh, that's rather like what the kinds of things that Kishore is doing. Um, uh, those are not the only interactions between such good intellectuals. I mean, you also have 1370s, Kurosh Atubla's court, so well after he's dead, but you know, within the memory of Khosro, you have the earliest, um, you know, you have the emergence in Khosro's time already of something called the Ajika Shastra in Sanskrit, basically the science of Muslims, right? Which is basically astrology and astronomy uh, practiced in Sanskrit, but heavily influenced by star charts and astronomical tables from Arabic and Persian, mediated through the Tugla court. And in the 1370s, and you have, uh, what's his name, uh, Mahindra Suri, the great Jain, Jaina uh, astro astronomer, who composed, uh, uh, what is it called? I think what it's called is Sanskrit text, which is the earliest Sanskrit exposition of uh, Persian astronomy. So all of these, you know, other interactions in medicine, Astronomy and then literature are all happening. And much of this is uh, motivated by the Sufi ethos or the ethics of engineering, if you like. You know, I, I wonder if you could uh, write a little more, give us a, a sort of simple essay or an editorial where more of us could understand where the thoughts of Amit Kushru blending so many different theologies and so many different regions. And, Right now we're talking about this, you know, Indianization of Hindutva and Islamization. And if you could just bring out to us that, you know, that the ancient thoughts were so parallel to each other and took from each other, that would be so wonderful. Consider that. Thank you for your really scholarly work. I'm a little intrigued. You did make a passing reference to Amir Kusro as the musician. <laughs> So I'm very intrigued because as a student of Hindustani music, we are taught 
that he was the architect of the Tarana. Right, right. He was the father of the Indian Ghawali. Right. So it would be very intrigued if you can just expand a little on so, what you said. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, his relations with music on the one hand are everywhere as well. He keeps referring to you know, the two points at which, or the one point at which he explicitly discusses music in any, in a kind of a sense even remotely described what is technical, is in one of his two prose works, Ejaz uh, Khusrovi, the Khusrov's Miracle. Um, translates in the second part of that, uh, which is made up of you know, episodes and so forth. But in there, he speaks of music. But you see, it's very hard. He doesn't say he meant the tamana, or the sitar, or the tabla, or kabbal. He doesn't say any of that. He just speaks of music, you know, in these. Uh, he claims to have made innovations, but because uh, it's very poetic prose, rhetorically ornate prose, and not technical, musicologically technical, it's impossible to conclude that he actually invented any of the phenomena you're describing. Um, uh, uh, could I expand <coughs> yeah. on that? See, it's in Mohammed Shah Rangila's court where you have the Khayal Gaiki. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering whether not having a textual record, does it decry the oral tradition that is very predominant of the subcontinent? It's only in the Tamil, it's only in the southern history that you have the recording of the Melakarta system. Whereas the North Indian tradition was extremely oral. Right. So, is it to say there is some studies which shows a stone edict right. somewhere in Kuru, between Kurukshetra or Rajasthan which shows how the Tarana okay. as a, you know, as a, uh, as toll came. Mm -hmm. So I'm just intrigued, I'm just expanding. This is not... No, yeah, no, no, you're very right to say why should we gain say the oral tradition you know, it would be making an old mistake in privileging uh, writing over reality. The thing is, though, that uh, the earliest records in North India we have of the attribution of Khayal to Khosro or Kabbal come from the 18th century, much later, right? And they come from Sufi Dagas. And I suspect that they are participating in a larger Indian idea of what's called, what a certain scholar calls corporate authorship. Right, so Kabir Bani, Kabir Panthi, for example, right? You people have your people composing in the name of Kabir, in the name, in Kabir's name, without being Kabir, or even the Vakari tradition in Maharashtra, right? I mean, which is full of writing, except for one saint in the entire Vakari tradition, which is Namdev. Who's Namdev? Namdev is one tradition, one poet who's famously, I think, illiterate or. Uh, at any rate, composes his poems completely orally and, you know, bypasses writing altogether. You have. People, you know, uh, Kirtankars in Maharashtra will sing, will perform Namdev. Uh, but, you know, you, you, can, you can't ever be sure that it's actually Namdev's text. What you can be sure of is it's composed in the way that perhaps arguably Namdev would have wanted or would have composed it. You know, so you're working in the realm of probability, cultural probability, rather than philological certainty. And that's what it is. My question is about your title, The Alexandrian Mirror. Um, the Alexandra is also, of course, a verse form. Yeah. Uh, La Fontaine wrote uh, widely in it and many yeah. others. Yeah. Um, and I was just, since we're talking about word play, mm -hmm. when I came to this talk today, I thought you were going to be talk, refer, I thought Alexandrian referred to the verse form. Right. Uh, since you talked, you know, you, you mentioned meter uh, and so on. So perhaps the Alexandra was derived from some of this Persian poetry? Um, that's one question. The other was about the um, anatomical uh, drawing that you showed. Um, the story in Western art history is always that Leonardo da Vinci um, invented this depiction of the human body, this kind of cross-section, which is used all the way to the present time in anatomy textbooks. But here you've shown us something from two centuries earlier from the Islamic world, that is that same kind of um, depiction. This, um, and then I can't help asking about the one uh, other image of the Prophet's night journey, where uh, the Prophet's face is shown. I guess it's from that Timurid period when it was allowed or it was happening anyway. I think the Metropolitan Museum has some of those paintings. Um, yeah, that one. So okay, so. Sorry, three questions. Yeah, question. uh, well, so the first part, I, I was in fact telling Bashmi this before the talk, you know, she was asking me about why Alexandrians. There is a connection. So, Alexandre de Bernier, who is a 14th century French romance poet who composed the life of Alexander in French and just this particular text. 
he composed, the life of Alexander, in uh, lines of 12 syllables. Yeah. It came to be called an Alexandrine because it was about the life of Alexander. That's it. Okay, so that's one answer. Uh, the other question was about the anatomy. So, your question is about why uh, Mansur's anatomy looks the way it does? Or? No, I'm just anatomy. saying that the attribution to Leonardo da Vinci, perhaps da Vinci had access to some of these drawings, had maybe derived his work from something earlier, from the Islamic world. I mean, no, I don't know. I right. have no idea. But it's just, you know, two centuries before da Vinci, and we attribute it all to da Vinci today. Yeah, uh, but I'm out of my idea. I mean, no, I'm not a method. Not even, forget about art story, not even a medical so nothing. I just know some, I know some nutrition, that's all. <laughs> no clue. But, uh, What was the question? Faith. So you see, this is uh, from, from Iran in the 1570s. His face is blank. Uh, but, and, but you know, the sort of... Uh, this was not always... This is again from Iran in the 1570s. Again, his face is blank. It's a two-page mirage, a night journey. Um, this is from the 1330s. And that's probably why, because these are Mongols who are barely Muslim, <laughs> you know, they were sort of Buddhist, whatever, you know, and they came in, uh, converged from Buddhism to Islam very recently, and it's already, it's made within living life. So, there's a kind of, uh, this is part of the illustration, part of a milieu in which it's perhaps the most cosmopolitan moments in living Iran. Um, I mean, you know, you, there's, there's a long convention of depicting the prophets with prophet with the face. There's no, so long as you do it respectfully, there's no problem. The idea that is never done is incorrect. But I thought it was limited to this period of time. Yeah, probably. I'm not, again, you know, I'm out of my damn I don't know. There, is, there are good scholars, I uh, forget her name, Christian Gruber would, uh, would have an answer to that question. I myself. Yeah. Prashant, what did uh, Alexander find at the bottom of the ocean? <laughs> so, okay. Uh, <laughs> let me scroll to that miniature. Uh, this one. Uh, well, he, there's a long chapter, a very beautiful chapter, one of my favorite chapters in Khosrow's Alexander, Life of Alexander. He descends into the ocean in the company of an angel, who's not depicted here. And uh, he, the angel says, well, aren't you foolish to cast your life into the water as you're a king? <coughs> and your kingdom would be in peril if you put yourself in. Alexander says, uh, look, you promised to help me, so help me and shut up. You know, um, you know, and I know that I'm in good hands, so that's why I'm not worried. So the angel says, well, all right, you know, I just wanted to test you. And then the angel screams into the ocean, and there's this vast whirlpool that opens up, right? And it sort of sucks up all of the ocean's whales and great fish, which begin to swim in a sort of circle, you know. Uh, and Alexander is suspended in his diving bell in the middle of the whirlpool, and he's sort of witnessing these vast creatures. You know, Husserl describes them in elaborate metaphors. He describes these fish as elephants in coats of mail. And he also says, uh, he speaks of uh, cave mouthed and elephant headed whales. Right? Um, he's ingenious with metaphors. So you have these. And then Husserl, uh, I mean, Alexander is wonderstruck. And then uh, the angel the makes them vanish by just staring at them piercingly. And then, just as he makes them vanish, uh, the sea lights up. You know, it's just prickled with lights, sort of stickled with lights everywhere. And these creatures that look like monkeys, hairless except for the hair on the chin, <coughs> hundreds of them, you know, gather around this test tube in which Alexander is suspended. Um, and they say to him, uh, they seem to, seem to be gesticulating at him, you know, in sign language you can understand. And then Alexander starts to the angel and says, what are, they? what are these people, what are they saying to me? And uh, you know, the angel says, these are monkey people who live in the ocean. They look like, no, he says that they look like monkeys, but they're sort of humanoids of some sort. They live the ocean people, water people. And they're saying to you, why aren't humans grateful for what God gives them? Because, you know, whereas elephants and tigers and lions stay content, rest content with you know, whatever they find to eat and, you know, they go about their ways and rest content, only human, the human, only the human seems to want to explore land and sea, you know, uh, and is never sated. Why aren't you grateful? And Alexander falls silent. And then he's shown further visions, vast creatures which pass by for a whole week, right, uh, or and things like that. And 
Then he says, uh, he's, you know, he's exhausted and exhilarated and uh, terrified. And the angel says, have you had enough? And uh, Alexander says, well, show me you know, anything else you have to show me. And then the angel says, well, I've just had word that you won't have much longer to live. And Alexander's terrified and he says, well, you know, a journey to heaven is easier than, I mean, a journey down underwater is uh, still easier than, uh, you know, going to heaven. And so, you know, you must prepare yourself. And uh, I'll show you one more wonder. Just close your eyes and open them. And he does that and he finds himself back on the surface of the ocean, very close to the shore. And his court philosophers, <coughs> Ilyas and uh, Balinus, so basically, they rush to the boat, fetch the boat in. And then he, re he recounts his adventures to them and then uh, lays out his will and testament that I translated. Can I, uh, can I uh, ask a question? Going back to the slide where you show the face of the uh, prophet, you know, the small verse, uh, can I ask what is the allegory or the significance of the man riding the creature that has the face of a woman and the body of an animal? I think it came later, earlier. Yeah, I'm just mad with it. Uh, so, you're asking this? Yes. So, this, so this is Burak, the, the horse on which the Prophet ascends to God's throne. Okay. Um, the Prophet. Yeah, and uh, you know, the word Burak is cognate in Arabic etymology with Barak, which means lightning. That's it, my God, when the Prophet rises up like a flash of lightning, right? Uh, that's, the, that's Gabriel. Was that's that Gabriel. That's Gabriel. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Richard, if you've written any essays on this, actually on ethics of engineering, I wrote one little piece, uh, I could have stuck it in, but that would have been a spoiler. Um, <laughs> yeah, in, the wire, in the wire. In the wire? I can send it out, or who can send it out. Yeah, uh, we're still continuing to think quantum computing, etc., uh, and singularity. But this is interesting that 1700 years ago they were thinking similarly. They each play with the next piece at that point in time. That is really nice. Uh, would you like, to, would you say that the whole idea of the secular thought that we have inherited today actually somewhere started at that time because the way you talked about the synthesis mm -hmm. and you know the appreciation without the religious overtones but acceptance mm -hmm. ah, okay that's a great question um you know it all depends on how we define secularism that's the you know, that's the, that's the, that's the real knob of the, of the matter um i think what we're actually talking about here is perhaps not is better perhaps better described as uh, you know to put it academically intersemiotic appropriations. <laughs> That's what they are. So you have you know science systems semiotics. You have science systems you know so kavya such as kavya has its own specific kavisamayas specific conventions. You can't violate them. You can play with them, but there are certain limits you can't cross. Likewise, Persian poetry and so forth. What happens? India happens to be the only place in the ge geography of the Persian age world, Balkans to Bengal, where you have, uh, where Persian encounters uh, a very prestigious written and literary tradition. The literary tradition, Sanskrit and all of its, you know, cognate literatures. Um, and yet if you read, you know, at any point of those thousand years, right, right up to colonialism, if you read, uh, take a good example, I mean, a good example would be, say, uh, uh, Abdul Rahim Khan Khan, right? To whom are credited several Balbais and Dohas in Raj, in Raj uh, He composed in Persian too. Never in his Persian will we find any mention of his Rajan or his Hindavi. And never in his Hindavi will you find any mention of his, of his Persian. It's as if there were two different persons. You don't violate codes when you're writing in different languages. Khosrow comes close to it by doing these strange things. But that's why he's a maverick thinker. Right? So, when you say secular, I think what's happening, what, what we actually see is basically, you know, me as a very pious Muslim, uh, enamored of this Sanskritic, you know, science system, whether poetic or philosophical, whatever, 
and appropriating it for my prestige, <coughs> and vice versa. Vice versa too. You know, you have uh, Jain author astro astronomy, increasingly from the 13th century, but I mean, Mahendrasuri is one flash, you know, the Jain uh, astronomer, but then really the big 16th century, you have the first, uh, you know, astrolabes built for pundits, right? Um, and pundit, pundits do, you know, completely pundit things with it. They're not going to do Islamic things with it. It's, it's just a mutual respect. Mutual respect, I would say, but there are lines that, you know, there's no question of, you know, my marrying your daughter. <laughs> you know, we get along because of certain divisions. We can we can meet each other on certain grounds because of certain divisions. That's the pre that's that's why it's not liberalism. It's it's a pre modern model of it's a pre liberal model of uh, coexistence. You live in silos which open up at certain <coughs> certain places. The court, for example, is a major frontier zone actually, where frontiers are crossed constantly. Akbar is the most, Akbar is Pandit, and so the most famous example, but it was already happening under the Tughlaqs, Firosha especially onwards, right? And Husro anticipates all these frontier crossings in all of these ways, right? So uh, there's no question that he was a very, very pious Sunni Sufi. There's no question of his becoming, you know, Hindu. That's not, you know, we were talking about, and likewise with Mahindra Suri, you're not going to see any of them, you know, I mean, you do have conversions, of course, but uh, when, when we speak of elite interactions, across these religious boundaries and so forth, uh, I would call them these appropriations. You know, I want to kind of grab and make, I want to grab what's so great about your particular textual tradition and make it work for me or mine, and vice versa. Hi, Prashant. Uh, I think I might have asked you this before probably, but um, what is the reason for decline of Persian intellectual thought? Um, because, I In mean, India. In India, I would assume in the West as well. Uh, what do you mean the West? I, mean, uh, I, West. Know, I don't know if there was any influence of Persian intellectual thought in the West before. West meaning Iran? No. Yeah, uh, not Iran, sorry. Uh, Europe. In Europe. 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 Yeah. But, uh, it depends on what you mean by Persian intellectual thought now, you know. Uh, For example, the scientific thought. Okay. Or, yeah, like even the well, Mansur so Senator. Yeah. Okay. So the real, I would say the broad reason, you know, is basically. Um, the Enlightenment in the 18th century, which presents Europe as uh, sui generis. It presents European intellectual history as something that owes nothing to anyone but, but themselves. You know, there's a direct line according to them from Aristotle and Plato to Europe to you know the Enlightenment, and you know uh, Islam has nothing to do with it. Whereas in fact, for example, if someone was asking about uh, was asking about medicine and anatomy, I mean uh, the Renaissance, for example, uh, the invention of monoc of uh, of uh, stereoscopic perspective painting, right? people like Davich and others, would have been impossible without 11th century Islamic optics, which was from so Ibn Haytham, Ibn Haytham, whose Latin name is Ibn Hazm. Uh, his work on optics was translated from Arabic into Latin. He was Iranian, he wasn't Arabic. His work on optics translated into Latin. Enter Renaissance Europe, uh, Italy in particular, Florence in particular, and uh, where it allowed artists to reimagine pictorial space in terms of three-dimensional depth. With the difference, the difference with the Islamic world was that since there was a kind of um, an-iconism or anti-illusionism, Abrahamic anti-illusionism in the Judaic and Islamic worlds, you didn't have bodies, uh, fully, full, full-figured bodies, or three-dimensional bodies, in Islamic painting, whereas you did in Catholic Italy because of the valorization of the flesh. Christ is God's word made flesh. So you have this combination. So you, you have examples. Of, so the Islamic influence, especially scientific and philosophical, scientific and philosophical, and uh, yeah, um, is richly felt. I mean, Avicenna's, Ibn Sina's, you know, great watershed Islamic philosopher of the 19th century. His uh, Shifa, the Cure, is compulsory reading in Europe in medical school till the 17th century in its Latin translation. Right. So the reason it, it sort of that kind of influence is largely the Enlightenment and the story it likes to tell itself. About the Arab origins. Do we see any traces of it in Yunani medicine, for example? Traces of what? Persian. Uh, Persian well, medicine. Yunani is uh, Persian mediated anyway. It is Persian. I mean, it's not. There's not. It's not. It's not a trace. It's actually Galenic, Arabo Galenic medicine uh, that you know spread across South Asia and is called Yunani today. So it's just called medicine then it did. You know, uh, it spread largely largely Persian. 
Where, then, where did you learn Persian? Uh, different places in Delhi, New York. <laughs> and what really led you to... I was interested in... My mother was... Uh, what are they? Uh, I don't know. Rootless cosmopolitans. <laughs> <laughs> One of those people. <laughs> 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 like Alexander. <laughs> 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 